today as we come to the table. There's going to be some that are greater in heaven and some that are going to be lesser in heaven because of what they believe about the Bible. Guys, this is huge. I'm talking eternal stuff here. Look, I know the Lord, I'm going to heaven. I don't have to worry. Okay, you don't have to worry about judgment. But here's what you should be concerned about. Will you be considered lesser in heaven or will you be considered greater in heaven? And I'm not talking about seeking position and trying to be important or whatever the thing might be. None of that's going to be in our heart there. We're going to have pure hearts before God. But what Jesus reveals here blows my mind. What he's saying is, because of how some of my kids belittled my word, they're going to be looked at as less in the kingdom of God. And those who honor my word, I'm going to hold them in higher esteem in the kingdom of God. Which one do you want to be? The Bible isn't just a book. It's more than words printed in ink on pages of paper. It's more than just history, poetry, and teachings written by humans thousands of years ago. It's not just a set of good principles to model your life after. It's not just a book. It's the Word of God. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. The Bible says that Jesus himself is the Word of God. See, if we try to pick and choose which parts of the Bible we're going to believe, we're picking and choosing which parts of Jesus we are going to believe. Today, Pastor Mark implores us to believe all of it. The importance of this can't be overstated. What you believe about the Bible will be remembered for all eternity. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, as he continues his message, God's Standards of Righteousness. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 5. As we go on through the book of Matthew, and we're going to cover three main areas today. We're going to be looking at the importance of God's Word, looking at the heart with murder and adultery. But I'm going to read just a first verse here, verse 17, then we'll pray and ask God to bless it, and we'll talk more in detail about what we'll be covering today. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for your word and the fact that you did not come to destroy any of your word. You came to exalt it. You came yourself to be exalted. And Lord, I pray now that as we continue on listening to this intimate, simple, but in-depth teaching here, as you taught all your disciples there on this mount, Lord, you would teach us, we're your disciples. God, we desire to learn. We desire to hear, Lord. Our ears are open. I pray now you would touch our hearts to receive. And I pray that you would be the teacher, God. We need to hear from you. So open your word to us, God, even as you did the multitudes on that hillside some 2,000 years ago. Open up, God, the ears that are here today that we might hear our Lord speak to us and teach us. We look forward, God, to what you have to say, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get into this next section here of chapter 5 again, again, I'm trying to cover larger sections than we did the first time we went through Matthew years ago. It's kind of hard to do. I don't want to skip anything. But again, I'm entitled today, God's Standards of Righteousness, Part 2. Again, not a real exciting name, but it really just sums it up. Remember, as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, these are God's Standards of Righteousness. And for those who think, you know what, I know what I do is if I'm going to be right with God, I'll follow the Ten Commandments. Or some people say, if I'm going to be right with God, I'm going to follow the Sermon on the Mount. Let me tell you something. The Sermon on the Mount is harder than the Ten Commandments. So if you want to pick one of the two to follow, make sure it's the Ten Commandments. And by the way, the Bible says you can't follow the Ten Commandments unless you're perfect and never break any of them and you can't go to heaven. So you can't get there by the Ten Commandments. But if you're going to try, that's the one to go to. It's the easiest. (laughs) The bottom line is we need the cross. We need the blood. We need the mercy. There's no other way to get to heaven. But why do I say that? We're going to see today as we get into this, the Lord not only talks about things from the law, from the Old Testament, he makes it way harder. And there's a couple of reasons he's doing that. One is he wants to show us very clearly that it's not by man's efforts we get to heaven. It's only by what he's done on the cross. And also, I believe in showing us that, he wants us to finally be broken and give up our efforts and our will and say, God, you're going to have to do it because I can't. 
It's a great place of freedom because when we're trying to earn our way to heaven, it's only going to get more and more frustrating as it did for the scribes and the Pharisees. And so although they no doubt were shocked on the day they heard this teaching and thought there's no way we have a chance now from some of the things the Lord said, as they begin to understand it, And as they began to walk with the Lord and know what he was teaching, great freedom and joy came because once you let go of trying to do it, there's such joy in simply walking with the Lord and enjoying the Lord. Now, again, remember the setting here. As we look at these, we're going to see, as I said, three different sections today. One is we're going to see God's viewpoint and Jesus' viewpoint of his word, which is extremely high, and we're going to be challenged by that. We're going to see also murder physically and in the heart, the Lord will address. Then we're going to see adultery, physically and in the heart, the Lord will address that as well. And we're going to see that if we've done it in the heart, we're guilty even as though we've done it in the flesh. We'll talk about that when we get there and how that applies. But the bottom line is, is these are the things that the Lord is showing us. It's not just the things we do physically, it's the things we do mentally that we will be judged by, and that's why we need the cross all the more. We can all brag about what we haven't done physically, whether it be murder or adultery, as two examples we could use, maybe many of us can make that boast, but the bottom line is, if you've ever thought about it, if it's ever crossed your mind by his definition, we're going to find out that we're guilty of that as well. Now, remember the setting. The Lord had seen the multitudes. And when he saw the multitudes, he realized, you know what? I'm going to go up to a place for those that really want to seek me. I'm going to make it a little bit harder. They're going to have to put forth some effort to come and learn from me. And he began to walk up the hillside where they gathered around to hear the teachings of the Lord. Because you can't be a disciple or learner of the Lord without putting forth some effort to learn from him. And so that was the setting. Now, he brought them to this field, which I think is interesting because, again, with the slope that it's on, it would have been uh, probably a field that would have been used for harvest. Uh, We don't know for sure. But again, you don't see any of the ancient ruins there when you go and see that area. So probably this was a harvest field, maybe a field that grew wheat. No doubt if it was, it had already been mown by this time. It can cut down with uh, their means that they did in that day and all the hay and stuff removed. But what a beautiful setting to feed God's people. Because not only was he gathering his sheep in a green pasture to feed them, it's this whole picture of the harvest ready to be harvested. God's seeing you are the ones that need to come into the kingdom. Some of them were already saved. Probably many of them are being drawn in, and maybe that's how we are today. Some of you here already know the Lord. Some of you God is drawing in because he wants you to know the Lord, and he's bringing you into the kingdom. And so the setting today is not unlike the setting of 2,000 years ago when this took place. We saw the Beatitudes, all the blessings, if you will. We saw the fact that we're salt and light, and we're to pray for boldness and be courageous and being a testimony for the Lord. Now we get into God's viewpoint of his word, and we're going to be challenged by this. And let me say this, there's going to be some things today that will challenge us. There may be some things today that convict us. There may be some things that maybe in a righteous and good way offend until we understand what God is saying. I'm not going to intentionally offend anyone. But again, God loves us enough to address the issues of our heart head on. And so he hits these things head on. We have to hit them head on as well. And the first one he deals with is how do you view the Bible? What is your viewpoint of the Word of God? He's now going to tell us what our viewpoint should be. And note this, what the consequence is if our viewpoint is wrong will be eternally as well. So this has eternal consequence, not just temporary. Notice what he says in verse 17 as he begins on the Word of God. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, first of all, what does he mean, the law and the prophets? The Bible in that day was referred to as the law and the prophets and or another phraseology they used, the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law being the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch, and then the prophets being, again, history and all the other books. Five of those books, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, that in that area, they were known as the writings. They're the poetic books. And so they would refer to the Bible not as the Bible, but as the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. They also called it law and prophets, law and writings, whatever. Everyone knew what they meant. And so the Lord says right off the bat here, look, I've not come to destroy, and I'm going to put it in our modern-day language because this is how we have to view this. Jesus said this, I did not come to destroy the Old Testament. Let that soak in for a minute because some of you from your backgrounds, you've been taught that the Old Testament is no longer needed today. The Old Testament no longer applies today. We don't need the Old Testament. Now we have the New Testament. We're no longer under law. We're now under grace. So let me first of all show you why that is wrong thinking. Number one, the law, as far as what you're thinking of, the official law, where all those rules and regulations, they make up about two and a half to three books of the entire Bible. That's all. Genesis is history. 
Deuteronomy is history, recap of what they covered. So the three in the middle would be the only thing that we could even classify as law. And so what do you do with the other 63 books of the Bible? And so the Lord's going to even say, look, I didn't even do away with those because even when you study those, you'll find out they speak about Christ, all the sacrifices, all that goes on there. So it wasn't the Old Testament that the Lord did away with. It was the requirement by the Old Testament to get to heaven that everyone thought they needed to fulfill. And what he's going to say is, it's no requirement you can fulfill. It's impossible. I have to fulfill it. And that's why he's making the bar so much higher on the Mount of Olives. You have to go even higher than the law if you're going to get into heaven. We'll see, he says in a moment, even the scribes and Pharisees are not going to get in by all their meticulous activity. So the bottom line is, is he's not done away with the Bible. He's not done away with the Old Testament. And I hear even people today say, well, we don't need to study the Old Testament. Listen, in the first century, that's all they had. When the church gathered together, if, we, if they didn't study the Old Testament, they'd come together and say, well, we have nothing to study today. So once again, we sang and you're now dismissed until we wait for a few decades and we finally have the New Testament. And after a few decades and we finally get the, des- the New Testament, we'll be able to gather as a church and get into the Bible. But until 40 or 50 years from now, God bless you guys, we'll see you in 50 years. It's ridiculous. No, the point is, this is all of God's word, every bit of it. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That means the Old Testament is God on paper. It's Jesus Christ. He said, it says over in verse 14 of the same chapter, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What it's saying is, this is Jesus on paper. Now, I know he's a real person, so we're not getting strange here, but the point I'm making is, this is Jesus. And if you take out a part of Jesus, which part are you willing to lay aside of Jesus? Which part of him are you willing to put aside? I want all of him. I need all of him. And he makes up the entirety of the Bible. That's why the Lord said, I am found in the volume of the book. It literally means in their mindset in that day, every single bit of it, every word. Now he's going to raise the bar even higher. Notice what he says here. He says, for surely, and again, how did he fulfill it? Let me say this before I go on. He fulfilled it by the cross. That is the law has to be fulfilled by every person or they can't go to heaven. Okay, we can't fulfill that. So Jesus had to come as a person, die for us, had to live it out as a man, which he did flawlessly, then die to pay for our sins, and now the doors opened to us because he fulfilled it. Didn't do away with it, fulfilled it. It's still very much biblical principle, and it's God's holiness and righteous standards even today. And he goes on and says, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Now, before we get into the verse farther, notice he says, for surely I say to you. I want you to note this as we go through the teachings of Jesus. He says this multiple times. We'll see it again today. That is not how the scribes and Pharisees taught in that day. They would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says, or Rabbi, you know, so-and-so says this or whatever. They quoted other leaders or our fathers would say, or tradition has passed down or whatever. And they might say the word of God says, and Jesus used that himself, but they would never say, but I say, uh, surely I say, why? Because that's taking the authority over the word of God. Jesus just now took authority over the word of God. He's not saying that the word of God is not authoritative. He's saying, I am the word of God. I am God almighty. You've heard it said, surely I say, I'm now speaking the word of God directly to you. Can you imagine when you walk with Jesus, everything he said was the word of God. Everything he said was the Bible. Try to imagine that. Again, I think about, you know, the only time I pretty much say the Bible is when I read the Bible and maybe by God's grace, something comes out that's right. Everything else I want to kind of erase. Everything he said was the word of God and was the Bible. He now shows his deity. He now shows his authority And that's why he blew them away because no one speaks like this man. No one has had this kind of authority because God had never become human before and dwelt among us. And notice what he says now. Again, we talked about how he looks at his word and how important it is. None of it has passed away. It's not going to pass away. It's all been fulfilled, but it's still in place. But notice this. Not one jot or tittle will pass until every bit of it. The word all. I have the word all underlined. Until all of it is fulfilled. Everything the Bible says is going to be fulfilled. Now, it's interesting when you think about, wait a minute, what does he mean by all of it? Let me ask you this question. Do you believe all of the Bible? Or do you only believe parts of the Bible? I know growing up and even now, you'll still hear people say, well, I believe this part of the Bible, but I don't believe that part of the Bible. Well, we talked about the fact that Jesus is the Bible, so which part of Jesus do you not believe would be the first question. But in addition to that is, 
Who are we to pick and choose the word of God? Well, I think man wrote it. Really? Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that God is big enough to write a book to pick which ones go in the one he calls the Bible, to supernaturally preserve it so that his children would know what is right and wrong? Do you believe that he has the power to do that? If you don't believe that God is big enough to write a book and preserve it, you've got bigger problems. He is God Almighty. He can write a book. He can preserve that book. He's written this book. He has preserved that book. And for those of you that need the scientific evidence, there's plenty out there. Again, the Dead Sea Scroll studies, all kinds of things will show you the very Bible they had in the Lord's day is the same one we have today. And even prior, hundreds of years prior to Christ, they had the same Bible that Jesus had and Jesus validated the Bible of their day. So the reality is you can rest assured that you indeed do have the word of God. Now, but I want you to note about this, all of it's gonna be fulfilled. When he says that, there's so much detail involved that I want you to miss every jot and tittle. With letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and of course, I know that the New Testament is written in Greek, the same principle applies to the Greek. That is, there'll be nothing in the Greek that will be left out. It's a very exacting language. But when the Lord was teaching, they didn't yet have the Greek New Testament. They had the Old Testament. They had, again, written in Hebrew. Again, the Septuagint, they did have some Greek writings from the Old Testament. They had both. But this would have been their main source of doctrine, if you will, in teaching. And so all these dots and all these things around the letters, they give a certain nuance to each of the words. They give a certain meaning to each of the words. And so even the in inflection of a word, even the way that a word is emphasized or the way that it's whatever the case, he says, even that's gonna come to pass. See how he's raising the standard. It's not just that the words are God-breathed, all of them. Was it saying in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it's all scripture inspired of God and it's God-breathed. He says, not just that every word is God-breathed, but even the punctuation is God-breathed and it will come to pass. You see, that's God's standard of the acceptance of his word. Again, I challenge us, what's ours? And again, I hear people say that all the time. You know, it's interesting, on the parts of it that we like, we tend to believe it. I'll bet you if you have parts of the Bible you don't like, or if you're using the excuse right now in your heart, man wrote it, challenge yourself, think about it, and I'll bet it's verses you don't like. Men, it's easy to remind your wife, wives submit to your husband, as to the Lord, right? That's an easy one. But what about where it says, husbands, love your wife just as Jesus loved the church and gave his life for her. If we give our life, if we lay our life down for our wives, they're not gonna have problems following our spiritual leadership. But it's easy to say, oh, I like the first verse, but I don't like this one. Why? Because there's something that we don't like in it. We have to receive it all. We can't pick and choose what verses we like, what verses we don't like. It is the word of God. It is eternal. It is unchanging. And God doesn't make mistakes. And God doesn't leave things out. And by the way, I would say, if you really believe man wrote it, first of all, you really don't even know God because you don't understand him. And so I would think if you're here today and you believe that man wrote the Bible, I would take that as a challenge that you don't know Christ. Because when God comes into your life, you realize supernaturally this is the word of God and you realize supernaturally God wrote it and you realize that this is God breathed for your life. I wanna challenge you. What's keeping you back from giving your life to Christ? What's keeping you back from receiving the Lord? Again, raising the bar till all of it is fulfilled, every bit of it. And notice what he says, whoever therefore, this is where it gets even more intense and really a little bit scary for me as a pastor, but whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so. Notice this, there's two categories here. What we do and what we teach shall be called least in, I have that circle, the word in, the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does not teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, why do I emphasize that? He's talking about believers here. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's saying those that are going to heaven, those that know Christ, there's gonna be some that are greater in heaven and some that are gonna be lesser in heaven because of what they believe about the Bible. Guys, this is huge. I'm talking eternal stuff here. Look, I know the Lord, I'm going to heaven. I don't have to worry. Okay, you don't have to worry about judgment, but here's what you should be concerned about. Will you be considered lesser in heaven or will you be considered greater in heaven? And I'm not talking about seeking position and trying to be important or whatever the thing might be. None of that's gonna be in our heart there. We're gonna have pure hearts before God. But what Jesus reveals here blows my mind. What he's saying is, because of how some of my kids belittled my word, they're gonna be looked at as less in the kingdom of God. And those who honor my word, I'm gonna hold them in higher esteem in the kingdom of God. Which one do you wanna be? This is powerful. There was a very famous pastor, I'm not gonna name his name, 
but he made a point publicly to let it be known that he was ordaining three women on staff. Now, let me make this clear. I'm not attacking women, and I have no problem with that. That's not the issue. We're not teaching on that today. But my point is this. The Bible very clearly says that one of the consequences of the fall, it has nothing to do with one being greater than the other. One of the consequences of the fall, Paul says in Timothy, he says, is that a woman can never be a pastor. That's one of the consequences of the fall. Now, as you know, much of the church ignores that today. And that's not our point today, so I'm not going to waste time on this. But when I saw that this pastor, who's well-known, who knows better, who knows Timothy, who knows what the Word said, said, you know what? The culture's changing. Society's changing. The environment's changing. I'm going to go ahead and ordain three women and put them on staff. I believe God's going to say, you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. Because I was very clear about what my Word says. You ignored it. And you did what you wanted. Oh, you're saved. You're coming in. Welcome into the joy of the Lord but you're not going to be what you could have been because you denied my word. Listen, believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. If you want to do your studies to see that it's true, there's plenty of evidence out there, but I'll tell you this. I would rather stand before the Lord. You've probably heard me say this to your sick of it. I'm going to say it again until I die because Peter said, I'll continue to say the same thing over and over and over so I'm out of here because it's important. I would rather stand before the Lord and say, I believed every bit of your word, Old Testament, New Testament, every jot and tittle, every bit of it, and I taught it as true, and him say, well, Mark, that wasn't accurate. I'd rather hear that than for me to stand before him and say, well, Lord, I didn't teach these parts because I didn't really seem like that could be right, and I knew that couldn't be, I didn't think this, and have him say, what were you thinking? This is my word. It's not man's word. Mark, you don't have the right to mess with it. That's not your right. I wrote it, I created, I'm God Almighty. I don't want that talk. I want the talk of, you know, which I don't think there'll be the talk of maybe I took it too far because he says here, not one jot or tittle. And he said, if we take his word least, if we remove any of it, if we ignore any of it, if we say it's not for today, times have changed, you know, there's this whole, all these social movements going on. I'm not gonna get sidetracked, trust me, but I wanna say this. In all these social movements going on, the church is starting to accept some of them and say that it's okay. And one church actually said, hey, this is just God common sensationality. God common sensationality? In God's common sense, God has said, you know what? I know that I eternally laid down these guidelines and I eternally laid down the way things are righteous or whatever, but as I see what's happening down there in this non-eternal world and they're changing all, I think I'm going to rethink this. Angels, what do you think? Now, I'm being sarcastic. Forgive me of that. You know, my girls hate it when I do that. The bottom line is God doesn't change. He's not going to suddenly decide because our society sees things differently that he's going to change something. Common sense will never come to God. He's righteous. He's holy. There's right and there's wrong. He stands on it eternally and not one jot or tittle will pass. Be that person that is seen as great in the kingdom because you took all of his word for what it says, literally, and you believed it. He says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, this would have blown them away. There's so many statements here that one after another, they would have just been, oh my goodness, I'm done. I'm done. If we're sitting there in that day, look, the scribes and Pharisees, they literally laid out their seeds. We talked about that. Thanks for joining us as we come to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark Kirk. In this series, Pastor Mark is teaching from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Do you remember the day you discovered the kingdom of heaven when Jesus first called your name? Just like the disciples who dropped everything to follow him, you were ready right then to give up everything else in your life to be with Jesus. As Pastor Mark goes through Matthew in this series, think back to that first love and let the flame be rekindled. Put yourself into the story and drop your nets to follow the teacher who performs miracles and then sit at his feet and learn how to love. We're so glad you've decided to join us for this series. There's nothing greater than spending time together at the feet of our Lord. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry out of Calvary, Knoxville. If you're in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love to see you in person. We have services on Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m., and Wednesday nights at 7. You can find our location at calvaryknoxville.org. And if you can't make it in person, You can find all sorts of messages available at thewaymedia.net or just download the Way Media app. 
Well, we've come to the end of our time together for today. But Pastor Mark has much more to share as we go through the book of Matthew. So make sure to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.